Well, we are in message number 35, 36, 37. I don't know where we're at. I know we're a long way into the book of Acts. And uh, we continue to look chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We started out this series talking about the book of Acts establishes the very first church. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the life of Jesus. Jesus ascends back to heaven. And then the church has started really in Acts chapter 2, the very first church. And then so the book of Acts just kind of gives you what happens. God tells us how he worked through his, through the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of ordinary people to get the church of Jesus Christ established. And he just used people like you and me and through different people, he used them to be able to start a church in one location, and then they went to another location and started another church. And uh, so we've now made it up to, of course, Acts chapter 18, where the Apostle Paul has been traveling. He was one of God's chosen men to go and establish churches. And he would simply go to, can you imagine that you you just go pick your family up and... uh, You just travel to a place you've never been before and you go there with the intent on establishing a church. Now you think about that. I used to, years ago, the church that I grew up in, we used to send out missionaries all over the world. Our church, this is the church I grew up in, people would give to support the church and then they would give to missions. And the missions would just, that'd be a separate ministry And we would have people in our church that would say, God's calling me to go to Russia, to Japan, to Germany, to Finland, to South America, to, they would just, and and our church would financially help support them, and they would go to get training, they'd learn the language, and then next thing you know, they're flying off with their family to a strange place, never been, they get there, they rent a house, they start talking to people, they start having church in their house, and from there it would grow, and then they'd run a building, and then they established a brand new New Testament church in another part of the world. That's amazing how God does that. But can you imagine that if God called you to do that? I know that people say, no, I couldn't do that, but if God called you, you can do it. And so we are looking at how God work through Paul to do just what I described. He went from place to place. And last week we looked at what happens when you're, you're going to these places you've never been to before, and uh, there's great opposition. As a matter of fact, what happens in life when there's great opposition? So God comes to Paul, and he tells him in verse 9, and we'll put it on the screen, this is what God tells him. He says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He said, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. So God comes and tells him, listen, I know you're in a place you don't know anybody, and I know you're in a place to where, you know, they could throw you in jail, beat you, whatever the case might be, there's opposition. But God says, don't be afraid. Too many times Christian people live their life in too much fear. Don't be afraid. Nothing's going to happen to you unless God allows it to happen. Nothing's going to happen. And so this is a message to us as well. It was a message to Paul, but we take it and we apply it to our life to understand that when we're doing the things that God wants us to do, don't be afraid. Do the right thing. God is going to be with you and God is going to protect you. And don't be silent we got too many silent Christians today. Speak up for the truth. If somebody doesn't speak up for the truth, then the truth will never get out. You know, if a lie is told over and over and over again, do you know eventually people will believe that as the truth? And that's what we see in our, in our world today. Lies, lies, lies. And after a while, people start saying, oh, well, that's normal. No, it's not normal. It's a lie. But if somebody doesn't speak up with the truth, then the lie gets turned around and it starts affecting people's lives. All right, with that said, let's pray and get started with a different message today. Father, 
This is the word, not my word. I don't have a word. It's your word. I'm just here to deliver your message to your people today. I pray that there'll be a love in this church and there'll be people that that will get a hunger in their heart and a thirst in their soul to say, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to dig and I'm going to put the work in to learn and know God. I pray that will be inside of every person in the church uh, uh, to take the time to say, I want to know God and I want to learn His Word and I want to know what He says and I want to know how to experience Him in my life because that's the pinnacle of all of life is to be in communion with our Creator. And so God, help us today. Take Your Word. Use it to minister to us. And don't let us leave here and keep it to ourselves. Let us go and tell others what we learn each and every Sunday. And in Jesus' name, I give thanks and prayer. Amen and amen. Every day, we all make choices and decisions. Every day. Some choices and decisions that we make in our life are really insignificant. They're really kind of unimportant. Although they can start issues like where are we going to eat today after church what restaurant are we going to go to and uh, but with God God doesn't really care whether or not you know you go to Texas Roadhouse or you go to Applebee's or wherever you want to go it, those choices and decisions are kind of insignificant and unimportant however there are other decisions that are very important Some decisions, and I I tell teenagers and young people this, there's some decisions that you make in your life as a young person, and it doesn't go away easy. It stays with you for almost ever. There's some decisions a person can make, and I call them defining moments, where it's going to take your life and it's going to turn you in a direction that you really can't turn around. And it's a very important decision, a decision that can affect you for years to come. So here's the question I have for all of us today. When we are faced with making an important decision, what is the process that we use to make that decision? What's the process of determining how you make the decisions in your life? Now let's think for a moment. Let's be smart. Everyone here has a process in your decision making. Something is presented to you and you're going to make a decision if you're going to do it, you're not going to do it, is your family going to do it? Are you going to do this for your child, not do this for your child? What is the process of how you make those choices? Because the process of how you think through that is very, very important. Because there's some people in life, and this is where a lot of times they get in trouble, is they make their decisions and choices on important things just based off their feelings and their emotions. And they don't logically kind of think through it. They don't can really consider the facts. It's based off how I feel today. And then they go and make that decision. And then sometimes when they do that, it ends up what? It ends up being a very bad decision. And then some people make decisions uh, logically or rationally. Not a lot of feelings involved with it. Not a lot of heart involved with it. It's just based off of of common logic and and, and reasoning. And then some people make decisions, the thought process, the decisions, and this would be the majority of people. The decisions or the process of making the decisions for most people is what best serves me? And that's true for all of us. We make decisions a lot of times it's not, how is this going to affect other people? How is it going to affect my marriage? How is it going to affect my children? How is it going to affect my job? How is it going to affect... But it's almost like, what is most self-serving to me? And that's the decision I'm going to make. That's what's going to drive the decision. Then there's some people that make decisions very, very quickly. They are spontaneous decision makers, impulsive decision makers. Why do you think when you go to the store that when you're checking out, they got those last minute aisles of shelves with the candy? All of that sweet stuff that's right there. 
Because they're thinking spontaneously, you're going to like, well, I didn't come in here for that candy bar, but it's right there. Boom, grab it. Let's get it. Some people are just making what I call impulsive buyers or impulsive decision makers. And uh, salesmen love you. They love you. Because when they know that when they get you into the store or whatever it is they're trying to sell you, they love you because they know that you have the personality to where you're not going to really think through it. You're not going to process it. You're not going to take time. You're just going to say, let's do it. Let's buy it. Let's get it. And then later on, you say, how'd I get into this? And then there's some people that make decisions very, very slowly and patiently. This would be me. That's how I am. My family sometimes gets aggravated with me because when their things, this decisions has got to get made, this is what I say. Uh, that's kind of an important decision. And if you want me to make a decision right now, at, at this moment, the answer is no, I'm not going to do it. Well, why not? I say because I haven't had time to really think about that. I haven't had time to what we might say sleep on it. I haven't had time, and here's the key, to pray about it and consider what God wants me to do. I don't make important decisions. I don't make big decisions. And I, I like to process, like, you know, kind of just let it just simmer and think through it before I make decisions. So salespeople don't like me because, because when they try to sell me something, you know, we go to buy a vehicle. I'm, I just tell them up front, if you think you're going to sell me this car today, it, it, it's a negative. It's not going to happen because I have to process it. And then, you know, there's uh, family decisions and things that's important and all of those things that you have to decide. And there's a process that each of you use in how you're making decisions. Now, here's the most important part, most, important part, most critical part of decision making for a Christian. Is God involved in the thought process of you making that decision? Does God even enter into your mind or in the process of your thinking? Again, God doesn't care where you go to lunch today. But when you're making decisions, that's not only going to affect your life, it's going to affect your relationship with God. It's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your marriage. It's going to affect other people around you, your family. Important decisions. Is God in the thought process of making that decision? So in Acts chapter 18, verse 19 through 22, God uses Paul to teach us a truth about decision making and when we make plans to do things. And it's really based off of two words. God willing. Let's read it. Acts chapter 18, here's what it says. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, and he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Here's that word. Remember I, I told you multiple times how he reasoned. It's, a, it, it's logic. It's, it, it's doing and thinking through things. And when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, what's it say? God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So I want to talk to you just about two words, God willing. It would be good to circle them, underline them, two very important words, because the Apostle Paul didn't start off his life considering God in the process of decision making. But now the process of how Paul's mind works was if it is God's will. If it is God's will. When we pray about things, you ever prayed about something and you want it to happen and you're asking God to let it happen? And, but... You should say, God, if it's your will for this to happen, God, if it's your will for this door to open up, God, if you want me to go and do this, 
God, show me and make it clear to me. God, your will be done. And God, if it's not your will, listen, shut the door. Shut the door. Don't let me go through that door, God, because it's going to be trouble. Now, when I was young, and I've told you this before, I was just so willful that when I got to the shut door, even though I prayed and said, God, if it's your will, shut the door, I'd get there and the door would be shut on whatever that situation was, and I'm rattling the doorknob, I'm kicking it in. I'm going through this door. I know, God, you told me that you know I better not do it, but I just kind of feel like, God, I'm going to do it. And then when I got on the other side of the door, I'm crying because I done got myself in a mess. You ever got yourself in a mess? You're like, how did I get involved with this situation? How did I get with these people? They got so much drama. They got so many problems. And now I'm in dealing with these people. How can I get away from them? God willing. So, My prayer for everyone here today is that you leave here with these two words embedded in your process of your thinking. God willing in every decision that you make. These two words will will just change your life because it has an effect on the choices and the decisions that you make. Young people, you're trying to, you're dating or you're, you know, you, you want to find somebody. You need to pray, God, send me to the right person that you have chosen for me to be the, my partner in life, my spouse in life, the person that I'm going to be with in life. God, you lead. Your will be done. You show me to that person. God, is this the, uh, uh, the career direction you want me to go in? God, do you have another path for me to go in? God, your will be done. What do you want me to do? And when a person becomes a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit does stuff. It starts a transformation process. Do you know when you got saved, when you become a believer in Christ, the Bible says the Spirit of God took up residence inside of your spirit. You got a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's in you. And the Holy Spirit, this is what happens to people. when they. I've met people through my life that were, whew, they were wild and crazy. And then one day they get saved. They come to Christ. And within four or five years down the road, you know what happens? They're different people. You know why that is? Because the Spirit of God's inside of them and the Spirit of God is changing them. The Spirit of God is taking them through a transformation. And listen, and how they think, how they act, how they talk, how they respond. He, God gives us a new mind if we let Him. Now, so he starts this process of a new way to think. Let me show you Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. This is a very important verse. Every Christian should know these verses. It's called a living sacrifice to God. We are actually supposed to, as believers, we're supposed to be people that have a heart to say, I want to sacrifice and give something back to God. I want to give Him my time. I want to give Him my finances. I want to give Him my talents. I want to give Him my abilities back to God. So Paul here says, I beseech you, or mean I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, oh, we're supposed to live as people that uh, there's a difference in how we live. We live our bodies a living holy and acceptable to God, which is the most reasonable service or reasonable worship of that we should say, God, here's my life. You take my life. You use my life. What do you want to do with my, what do you want me to do with my life? And then this is very important, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, that's one of the major issues we have today in Christianity, is that Christianity has become too conforming to the world. There's no distinction between church and Christianity than it is the rest of the world today. There should be something, not that we're weirdos, or we act stupid or crazy, or do like bizarre stuff, but we should be people like, hey, there's some character difference in us, there's some moral difference in us, There are some things in us as people where people can see, hey, that person's different. They don't act like everyone else. And we shouldn't conform or pattern our life after the way of this world. But to do what? Be transformed by what? what? The renewing of your mind, how you think, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
There's the perfect will of God. There's the permissible will of God. Those two are different. I don't have time to get into that today. That'd be for part two or another time. But, so, the process here is, God says, I'm going to transform how you think. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, which is another great passage, a chapter of Scripture, it says, let this mind be in you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to us. He's talking to believers. What mind? The mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The process of how God works is He saves our soul. We become believers in Him after we put our faith and belief in Him. And then we become what the Bible says, born again. And I know people in the world said, that's just really weird that you say you're born again. But we're not born again by the flesh. We're born again, what? In our spirit. And it becomes alive because Christ comes to live in us. And what happens is, then what that takes place, then what, uh, the Holy Spirit is trying to make us what? More Christ-like. That's actually what the definition of the word Christian is. Christ-likeness. Unfortunately, people say I'm a Christian, but there's nothing about them that's Christ-like at all. And so he says, but your mind. Now, what was the mind of Christ? Well, Jesus was on the earth. What was his mind? Now, let's see what it says. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but what? The will of him who sent me. So here we come back to the foundation of where Jesus said, not my will be done, your will be done, Father. Paul, as we just read, Paul said, God willing, if it's God's will, if it's the Lord's will, I will return back to you. But if it's not, we will take it as it wasn't God's will for me to be here and come back to you. Same way with Jesus. John chapter 4 says this, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. So Jesus, this God's will, even was in the life of Christ when He was upon the earth. Luke twenty two forty two 42 says this, Father, if it is Your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but Yours be done. There it is. Jesus is in, the, in this verse, Jesus is in the garden. He's about to be arrested. And they're going to beat him. And they're going to beat him badly. And then they're going to nail him to a cross. And he knows it's coming. And so he goes in the garden and he prays. And that's what he says. He says, Father, is there any other way to save the souls of the people of this world? Is there any other way? If it is, so be it. But if not, your will be done. And he went, and right after that, they arrested him, they beat him, and they nailed him to a cross. See the thought process? And so for the Christian, God wants us to change how we think in our choices and the decisions. And it has to be a habit of our life. Sometimes I'll have conversations with family or people, and Somebody will say, well, you know, we thought this was going to happen. And my response will be, well, it didn't happen. So guess what? It may not have been God's will. God has something else planned. Sometimes we face rejection. And it's hurt. Rejection is a very painful thing. But sometimes it's not God's will. Because we want something to happen and God intervenes and He protects us. Rejection can be God's purest form of protection. It's how God steps in and says, I know that you might want to do this, but just like a child wants to do things and the parents say, what? No, you're not doing that because that's, what, that's not what's best for you. You can't see it now. When you're, when you're training your child, your child can't see why you tell it no all the time. They just think that you're the meanest, worst parent in the whole world and all their friends get to do it, but they don't get to do it. And how come? And, but they can't see that 
when you say, no, you're not doing that, and you impose your will upon them, you're protecting them. You're helping them. I remember as a child, I'd tell my dad, well, all the other boys, they get to stay out and do this. My dad said, all them other boys don't live here. I, you live here. And my job is to protect you. And my dad used to say all the time, I'm not your friend, I'm your parent. And sometimes you may not like me as your parent, but just know that I love you, and what I'm making you do, I'm doing it for your own good. And this is what he always used to say all the time. I'm not trying to win a popularity contest with you, Ricky. You might want all your buddies at school to be popular with them, but I don't care to be popular with you. I'm your father. And it's going to be my will over your will. And I would think, you're the worst dad in the whole world. I can't stand you. One day when I can move out of this house, one day I'm out of here. I tried that. One day I told them I was moving out, and they went and got the suitcase and set them at the door. I said, well, I guess I'm going to hold off for another night or two. It was cold that night. I'm like, I ain't moving out tonight. I think I was about 13, and I was going to move out. Didn't go too well. It just says parents, God does the same thing. And you have to change how you think, and God wants you to change how you think. For example, God, is it your will for me to take this new job? God, is it your will for me to put my family in this situation? God, is it your will for me to put my child in a particular school? God, is it your will for me to sell our house, maybe relocate, go to another place? I've known people that they just up and just kind of willy-nilly just say, I'm moving, and off they go, and they get where they're going. They're like, I talk to them, and they're like, hey, we're miserable here. I'm like, well, did you think through that? How do you know it was God's will? Is it God's will for you to make that big financial decision? Finances that you have, it's, you know, it, it really all belongs to the Lord anyway. Everything you got belongs to God. And sometimes we just keep, you know, the American way is, you know, I, I remember when I was young, I'm like, if I could ever make $30,000 a year, I'll be rich. <laughs> you get to 30 and you're like, I'm still broke. <laughs> you know, people live right up to the threshold of however much money they make right up to the threshold. I've done jobs with people years ago and I'm drawing some plans and designing some plans for them and I get to their house down to Virginia Beach and man, they got this great big house and they got a Jaguar sitting in the driveway and they got a BMW and I mean, they, I'm like, wow, you know, it's pretty impressive. And I go in there and they're like, hey, we're going to give you a check to get you started, but can you hold it till next Friday till our, our money clears the bank? I'm like, what? You know, so... People live up to here, no matter where, how much money they make. They don't live down here. Think about if with the money that you make now, if you could live like, you know, where you were at when you were at $30,000 a year. You could make some money, couldn't you? But we don't. So is it God's will for you to make those financial decisions? And sometimes in life, we just have things that happen and we just have to pray about it, and we have to involve God in that decision and let God work it out. And then we say, God, is this your will for me? Is it your will for my family? And if it, and if it doesn't work out after we've prayed that, then we can say, it must not have been God's will and be at peace about it. Now, the Lord, even in what's called, people call it the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the model prayer. If you really want to know what the Lord's Prayer is, read John chapter 17. That's the real Lord's Prayer. But in our society and Christianity, people like to say, well, this is the Lord's Prayer, which we're going to look at it in just a second. But John chapter 17 is really where God talks to God. It's my favorite chapter in the Bible. It's an amazing chapter for me because it's like, what would God talk to God about? It's, it's awesome. 
But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, we have what's called the, the model prayer, or you know, some people call it the Lord's Prayer. So let's put it up on the screen. As a matter of fact, let's just all read it together, okay? Let's start off, and everybody, let's just read it out loud. It says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, packed in the middle of that, says what? Thy will be done. We are to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In our own life, in the lives of others, in the life of our nation, in the life of our church, we are to pray for God's will to be done. See the thought process? God's people are not to be making decisions and decisions and decisions and not consider God in the thought process, a renewed mind. Paul says, God willing, and that's how we have to think too. That's the way God wants us to think. And it is the best way to think. So if God tells us that when we pray that we are to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So for all of you Bible scholars and theologians that's in this church, and I know we have many. You ever, some of you, you know, you think I'm weird because I think about stuff like this. But this is where you think now. So if God says for us to pray for His will to be done on earth as is as it is in heaven, the question is this, does God's will always get accomplished on earth? You have one group of theologians that say, well, God is 100% sovereign, which He is. He's 100% in control. And His will is going to get accomplished. Well, that is true. But on the same side, why is it that he tells us to pray for his will to get done on earth as his will is accomplished in heaven if things on earth occur that's not his will? Make sense? You've got to think about that. Is it God's will for people to die and go to hell? No. The Bible says God is not what? Willing that anyone what should perish. Ah, there's a thought there. Think about that. When someone does evil things on this world, is that God's will? No, it's not God's will. So does God give us freedom in His sovereignty to make choices and decisions? He does. He does. Sometimes in my life in the past, I've had situations and I said to myself after that situation ended, I said, I don't really think that that was God's will. It didn't happen. Do you know as people that we can make decisions and push back? The Bible says we can resist the Holy Spirit. Isn't that an interesting thing to think that the, the sovereign God of the universe can give us the ability to think, to make choices and decisions, and to pray that His will gets done on earth as it is in heaven? Why does He do that? Hmm, something to think about. So how we make decisions is by praying and asking God, God willing. There used to be this, I don't know, my old people used to say this, and some of you know this because some of you are old. <laughs> people used to say, God willing, and if the creek don't rise. You ever heard that? That's some kind of southern thing. I never understood what the creek don't rise, you know. 
I guess if you're somewhere to where there's a creek and it, you know, you get flooded out and you can't make it across the creek, I don't know what all that means. It's kind of always been kind of weird to me. But people used to say that, God willing, and if the creek don't rise. So sometimes in life, it is things don't happen because it's not God's will to happen. And sometimes in life, things happen because it is God's will, because we've surrendered to God's will, because we pray for God's will. And let me tell you what it does for you. This is what it does for you as a person. When you're a person and you're praying about whatever situation you're facing, and you say, God, your will be done, whatever that is. If I get this job, your will be done. If I don't get the job, your will be done. God, if this financial situation, whatever that is, medical situation, this situation, that situation. And let's just say that it doesn't happen. You're at peace to know that God had another plan and that he has something else involved or something else in mind and that his will may or may not have been done, but you prayed and you say, God, your will be done, whatever that might be. And if it doesn't, like I say many times in my life, well, I, I wanted it to happen. It didn't happen. I prayed about it. Evidently, it wasn't God's will for my life. It wasn't God's will for my family. And so I had peace and I move on. And that's how we build confidence in our faith is by trusting the decisions and making God a part of our thought process in the things that we do. So when you leave here today, don't forget those two words as you're making choices and decisions. God willing. If God wills, God, is this your will for my life? And if you're making decisions based off of God's will for your life, it'll be perfect. Perfect. It'll be exactly where God wants you to be. God willing. Don't forget it. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you for your help every day and throughout our life. We live in a world of hurting people. You've called everyone in this church to leave this church and go out and be a light to other people. I pray that we're doing that. Everywhere we go, we look at the face of people every day and we should think, I wonder if this person knows Christ as their Savior. And God, has you, have you put me in the path of this person's life? Is it your will? For me, maybe to talk with them about you. And we know that it is. Because God, we know there's certain things that it's automatic. It's your will for us to do. And one of those things is telling others about you. And so, God, I pray that we will change how we process our decision making. And in doing so, God, we will be more at peace with life and the direction that we're going in as we let you lead and we stop leading. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. Is everyone here today, if the day was your last day on this earth, are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? That's a serious question. You say, well, I, I, I want to go to heaven. Well, there's only one way, one way and one way only, and that's to put your belief and faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ that He is exactly who He says He was. He came to this earth. He died on the cross. He resurrected from the grave. And you understand and admit that He came and died on the cross because you're a sinner. And you're willing to turn from sin, turn from the world, and turn to Him and accept Him as your Savior based on the authority of God's Word, if you do that from your heart to God's heart, it's belief and faith in Christ as Savior. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, our heart, that God raised Him from the dead, the Bible says we shall be saved, rescued, so, and become a child of God. So if you've never done that, 
You can do it right now this morning. You can put your faith and trust in Him as Savior. All you have to do is have a conversation with Him and in your words tell Him just what I explained to you and He'll save your soul and give you eternal life. And then Christian, i got to challenge you to change how you think. you got to start in the process of thinking. Is this God's will? Is this really God's will for me, my family? What am I doing? Why am I really doing this? Is it really that important? Is it a negative thing? Is it a positive thing? Is it producing fruit? Is it not producing fruit? Is it, is it something that's bringing me down or lifting me up? And you have to look at those, whatever those decisions and choices are, and say, is this really God's will for us to do this? What are we doing? What are we doing? And then ask him. And then whenever he lays it upon your heart, then you listen and you follow. So God wants to hear from everyone here today. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, just I want to ask everybody just, just sit right there, just whisper and pray with your heads bowed. You can pray internally. God hears everything that you think. And just talk to him. What do you need to share with him today about your life? You pray. Father, bless all that we do as we try to stand for you. We live in a world today that is just in utter chaos because they've turned their eyes off of God. It's an interesting thing that on the currency that we carry around with us, it says in God we trust as a nation, but yet our nation is not trusting you any longer. We trust ourselves. We trust in people. We trust in a government that is corrupt. God, I pray that you'll shine your light on the darkness and reveal them for who they are. And God, that you'll protect our families and our children and all that we're trying to do to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and get the truth out to others. Let your will be done for everyone here. Let your will be done for Cross Life Church. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.